Knowing this near universal pattern helps to assess new brands and existing ones. What don't marketers know? Quite a lot, aren't we? I think we live in an anything goes world where you know, the latest fashion or fad drives an awful lot of practice. Segmentation is the recognition you can't serve everyone with equal satisfaction. This is the Zach Asbury Show. Welcome. On today's podcast, we have Professor Sharon Rundle Tealy. Now, Sharon is the founding director of social marketing at Griffith and the editor in chief of the Journal of Social Marketing. I have to start by noting just the high level of respect that I have for Sharon, even before we recorded this podcast. Sharon, for a lack of better words, has balls. Her internal drive has led her to starting Australia's largest social marketing center. Now, of course, that involves many skills, such as finding funding for research, writing grant applications, publishing within journals, conducting research that matters for our communities. And she does this while having uh, that delicate balancing act between, you know, families and, and, and career. We get some hot tips from Sharon as well about the benefits of collaborations, finding our tribes at conferences, and the roles that mentors can play in our lives. When you listen to the podcast, I think you'll understand why I have such high respect for Sharon. So without further ado, Professor Sharon Rundle Tealy. Perfect. So um, yeah, welcome to the podcast, Sharon. Thank you for taking time out of your day to have me. Uh, so just for everyone who's listening at home, um, I just finished giving a presentation to Griffiths University. Uh, so I was presenting a little bit to do with my research on how people buy fresh fruits and vegetables, and Sharon and her team here were kind enough to let me present here. Um, but today we're very actually fortunate to have Sharon. Um, so Sharon. Maybe I could say a lot about you, but maybe it's better coming from you. Okay, well, thanks for having me, Zach. Um, my name's Sharon Rundle Tealy, and I'm a founding director of social marketing at Griffith. And years ago, I was kind of left understanding I could use marketing to sell product. I can sell to more people more often, more occasions. And I personally just had a moment where I thought, well, maybe I should use my talent for other reasons. And I'd set a, a university essay for my 101 students, and it was on corporate social responsibility. Okay. And at the same time, I was working on a project in health, and I, for the first time, truly realised that there are people that grow up in households where they don't have the same access to foods, they don't have the same advantage and opportunity in terms of parents who could teach them to eat a healthy meal. Um, in fact, I've learned since there are some kids that grow up in houses where no one cooks them a meal ever. Wow. And the kids themselves are surviving, you know, by going through a freezer or looking after themselves in some other way. Um, and so that, I guess my social conscience had tipped in and I realised being a university, like, um, taxpayer-funded person that maybe I could use what I had learned through commercial marketing um, to assist to deliver social health or environmental change. So something that benefits people and planet. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Okay, so you started off in very much a traditional sort of academic role and then you realised that there was this need in society to kind of give back? Yeah, so I'm a Bachelor of Business trained person who early in life kind of explored marketing and information systems as two possible avenues to go down. Um, I, by all means, I was pretty talented with the information system side, but um, just something in it, I think I knew enough that I'd get bored. Yeah. So marketing became my pursuit and I pursued it with a fair bit of rigour. I was studying at University of South Australia I left, I went into industry and started selling products. So I worked in supermarkets and fast moving consumer goods for nearly three years. Okay. And at this point in time, um, I went on to lead a, an agency that was selling fruit and vegetables, working out of the Adelaide fresh produce market. That's kind of cool. <laughs> awesome experience and, and worked with um, essentially a lot of freedom and was just given a simple task of running the promotion agency. Yep. Um, so I built that agency up and took it to having two staff to many, many staff. Um, and at that point, a letter had come out from University of South Australia offering a scholarship opportunity to study masters. And I was running someone's agency for you know their business, them, and at the same time, sort of left going, oh, babies, kids, and all of that fun stuff. So yeah. I actually um, went back into university and studied. And so you took them up on the scholarship offer? Took the scholarship offer, went back in and literally had to explore 
marketing science, um, went on a journey of, you know, customer loyalty and, you know, understanding the side of life of why people buy more product more often. Um, but fell in love with research to some extent, the yeah. freedom. Um, wasn't really sure where to go next and was lucky enough to have a conversation with a colleague who kind of taught me what might be possible. Um, so from that moment, I went forward and actually also went straight from master's into PhD um, with a clear understanding of where I wanted to get to. And some of my early studies were really founded on breaking down how you actually bring about change. Um, because I understood from my industry side that I could get in and disrupt. I'd been taught a lot about consumer behaviour and patterns of buying behaviour. Um, but patterns are great. They teach us what we know and they don't necessarily help shape the how else do we get and break that pattern to actually bring about the new the new business as usual that we actually need to see. Um, so that was my early journey. And I moved between states. I went from South Australia up to Queensland because my parents had retired up here. And okay. Wait, Dad, were you originally from Queensland? No. no. Dad had a dream. He just wanted to go fishing. Okay. Well, so when he sense. retired, he did. So he moved up north. Yeah. And so my parents <laughs> were like thousands of kilometres away. I'm a mum, three kids. Um, a husband, a bit unsure about where he wanted to go, and so we took a move, and we've never looked back. We came into Queensland, settled in here, and at that point in time, it was like I knew I needed to find my path in terms of being an academic and what am I going to do. Um, so I started off on the, the career ladder of early academia and being a lecturer, started at Griffith University, okay. um, and only yesterday moved back into my first office that I ever started at at Griffith. You've come full cycle. <laughs> yeah, so I've gone full circle across the now <laughs> 19 years that we've lived here, Wow. Um, which is fun. I left Griffith for a short period of time, about three years. Yeah, that was just about what I was going to say. And that was jumping the academic ladder because I was a little bit ambitious and wanted to just cut straight up as fast as I could. You don't strike me as an ambitious person though. Not at all. <laughs> I'm clearly joking. Not at all. Where did you go for the three years? Um, so I took a move between senior lecturer to associate professor and went out to the University of Southern Queensland. Okay. And it was based up at Toowoomba or Springfield, so mm. it was only on the outskirts of uh, Brisbane. And one of my senior managers had also said to me, go and get international experience. Um, so an opportunity came up through a conversation with a colleague and I spent six months in Lethbridge over in Canada. And that six months is the story of social marketing at Griffith because I landed into the centre of socially responsible marketing and there were about five academics there who were all teaching in the marketing space but all coalescing together on a thing. And it reminded me that centres are a great place to be. Yeah. I'd grown up in the Marketing Science Centre at University of South Australia. It had a young, energetic group of people working together on a common sort of outcome and cause and idea, you know, pursuing science to understand patterns and see what they could find. Uh, Lethbridge was a, a different kind of centre and structure that was set up. But when I hit Queensland again on the next job rung, mm. so at that point I'd landed permanent associate professor um, came back into Griffith and then had conversations with senior management to ask the question, could I, could I do this thing called social marketing? And at that moment in time, like social marketing is credited back to Kotler. Mm -hmm. And um, from about 1972, like Kotler took an idea that someone else had proposed, um, why can't we sell brotherhood like soap? and essentially started to actually demonstrate that marketing could be applied for social issues. So we took up the sort of like work within social marketing at Griffiths, which was already happening well and truly everywhere around the planet. And within years I learned that Griffith was the first place to teach social marketing in Australia under Susan Dan. That's really cool. Who had left and jumped a few spots. So that became a bit of a full circle kind of moment too. Um, but in short, my university gave me the buy-in, you can do it. They didn't give me any funding and from that moment I just started finishing out anything that was commercial, only saying yes to social projects and over time went on to build a centre that today is 46 staff and wow. higher degree students. So that's the, uh, the sort of professional side of my time here and, and what I founded and, you know, came to actually grow and, and do you still love doing today? Yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, like I, I did my undergrad at UniSA and kept going with honours, master's, PhD and now doing a postdoc there. And so I've been quite um, insular in terms of only having been part of a, a research centre 
Um, so I don't have the direct experience, but when you speak to other people who aren't, you can see the, the benefits of being there, the peer review, the scrutiny of your ideas, the access to greater collaborations, um, greater quality of data. Um, there's so many benefits from it. So when you, so you came back from Canada, came back to Griffith, and it was, it was just you. So who were the founding members of social marketing at Griffith? So there's a few characters who are involved firmly in the centre today who were very close to being there from the start. Okay. So Dr Julia Cairns took a punt on me and the social marketing at Griffith sort of thinking. Um, so at the point that the centre was still an idea and, and obviously supported and backed by management, uh, she managed to sell to her management to study a PhD in social marketing under supervision. Um, Dr. Timo Dietrich came in via a colleague who had come in via another colleague, so a bit of word of mouth recommendations, mm -hmm. but I kind of used some of the history of what I knew how to do and just started pulling in projects and servicing work to start to build the capacity story. And Timo came in and just worked as a research assistant under a project that we were running for Marta Hospital and then also Blurred Minds, which today still exists. Uh, he went on to actually think, maybe I'll do honours, and then went on to actually do PhD. And he's, he has a fun story because the story sort of becomes one of, well, I'm here because of Sharon and, and an idea. Yeah. Um, and so he, he went forward to study and today is serving uh, as the Deputy Director of Engagement in the centre and is, yeah. you know, just a driving force helping to just make more happen. Um, and it's people like Julia and Timo who've been right there from the start Joy Parkinson, who um, I had met through colleagues, and she pretty much, after a phone call, decided to sort of switch from one university across to the other. Um, Samir, who I met in Canada, yeah. and other colleagues had met, finally, after two years, decides to actually join us. Yeah, um, he spent six months here as, like, as a convent or something, right? Yeah, rest was history. Like, he went away, went back to Singapore, went back to Canada, and then one day kind of just went, maybe I will come. Yeah. Um, and we're lucky enough that he actually joined the centre too because he's just such a fabulous colleague and, and a great academic thinker that's been so active in this space ever since he studied under Mike Rothschild. Um, so there is so many who are part of the centre story and how we've come to be such a large team because they met through study, they are committed to social marketing and really see value in the work and want to be here. So we spend a lot of time writing a lot of proposals, trying to bring pockets of money together mm -hmm. to make as much happen as we can. Yeah, so it's um, my understanding is you mostly go for sort of category two income, is that right? Um, the and history of work that we were doing was anything category two to four funding. So yeah. for the academics in the world, it's the level of competitiveness of ground grants. Yeah. Um, but more recently, like we've been winning a lot of category one work as well. Okay. And, so um, ARCs or from, 20, or from 2019, like my own story is one of probably one dollar in five is now category one funding, possibly as much as one in four. Mm -hmm. I've never quite sat down and broken it back down. Yeah. Um, so that tells us that the the highest, most respected level of um, sort of awarded funding you can get for research, to me just says there's a lot of value in the work that people can see. You don't win them all, but we are above the actual award rates by nearly double. Okay. Um, so we know how to win them and are just continually putting asks out there to say, please fund this work because sometimes having the freedom to do the work you really need to do is needed and category two to four funding's great, but it's someone else's, they've got a vision, they know what they need and our job is to service that and hand them the outcomes that they actually need. And that doesn't always allow the actual research questions that really need to be asked to be included in the work. And that to me is the power of Category 1 funding and, and why we should be brave enough to step up and say, please pick me, I am good and, and I should be funded to do this work. Wow, that's, yeah, so they kind of, yeah, they are very different, right? So Category 1's sort of more federal government, highly competitive, and then you know, I know Category 3 is sort of more industry-based. So Category 2, my understanding, is it's more local government. Is that right? Category 2 is still considered competitive Com yeah. because it's um, typically provided through a tender process. Um, so in some cases, you have to actually be elected onto a panel to even be asked to apply. Okay. In other cases, it's just open merit, but it's competitive selection. So you are responding to some work with a plan, and it's a really clear costed-out plan. 
Um, but they are then sitting there with 10 plans in front of them to decide which one of the 10 they're actually going to award funding that they have available to. Um, so I consider it to be equal in yeah. some respects to the national competitive grant, so what we call the Category 1 funding. Yeah. Um, but Category 1 rates are still typically slightly lower than a Category 2 rate. Um, and it's interesting because I think senior management still today celebrate the Category 1 wins. We yeah. hear a lot of rhetoric now supporting anything Category 2 to 4. But it's funny, you still see a difference in terms of what's getting recognised and how much excitement's generated when you've won that next sort of Australian Research Council or NHMRC grant. Yeah, it's definitely and it's something that the university likes to promote as well. Like we won X number of Category 1 income or, yeah, it is very highly celebrated, um, that's for sure. And it's celebrated because it takes a heck of a lot to win them. Mm. So you have to get an exceptional portfolio of work to be able to sell the work that you can actually do. On top of that, you then have to craft applications down to the last dotted I, cross <laughs> T. Um, they're an incredibly refined piece of work and like from a, a typical application, like they're often as many as 50 to 120 pages. Mm, it's like wow. writing a thesis. Yeah. Um, so and I just can, to get the funding to do the research. I can be awarded <laughs> as much money on a two-page mm. written document and there's a big difference in terms of pulling one mass document together versus you know a much more concise piece that just says here's the plan and please fund it so they are different beasts to attack yeah oh 100 so i've never i mean the institute the Ehrenberg bass institute model is not one of category one income we have more category three i suppose very industry funded um so but i have noticed i've been through a they call it an ecr or early career research and development program so it was run by um, Professor Pat Buckley with us, and she's, she's very good at doing it. And because it's um, ECR, so people within the first five years of their PhD, all in one room, different disciplines, uh, m most of them, their research funding is going to come through Category 1. So they had all of these sessions about how to apply for it, the support structures within the university to get it done. Um, and I've noticed that the key thing that I took out of it was the U university itself is quite happy to fund sort of smaller pilot projects to kind of have like a proof of concept to then go into that larger grant and then to show that, you know, there's something here, some initial findings. Is that something Griffith do or something that your team do? I think right across this, the, and I have to say this is a planet wide, if you are working in the Category 1 grant space, it is about being the right team for the job yeah. and delivering beyond doubt that you and proving you would be the right team that can actually do that job. So the reasons that universities are investing behind these applications or giving pilot seed funding is to get that demonstrated track record yeah. because it's that track record that is needed to actually secure the research income. Like You don't get awarded a million dollars on a maybe. <laughs> you get awarded a yeah. million because you can actually step up, get it done and deliver value off that dollar. Um, and I think the important thing across how we communicate research and think about research is to start applying a bit of the classic economic value back onto the way we think about research. Yeah. What are we getting? Where is the bang for the buck? And if you invest a dollar in this, what consequence or in outcome is there in community? If that one dollar is invested, can we get some money back for it? Um, the days of just handing money out mm are going and if they're not going they're already long gone so it's, it's not quite there I do still see a bit of money getting handed out with not enough questions asked for what is this really doing mm -hmm. yeah and no, I kind of am supportive of that because you know it is taxpayer money and taxpayers pay salaries and stuff like that so they should expect you know a good return on that investment you know if we're giving you a million dollars to to find a, a solution to a problem, well, that problem should be large enough and it shouldn't just be to, to float your job or your centre, it should be to actually get some benefit. So are we going to improve public health? Are we going to make systems more efficient? Whatever the project happens mm -hmm. to be. Um, I'm kind of glad as a, as a citizen but also as another academic that, that there is a lot of scrutiny in this process because um, otherwise silly things are going to get funded and that's, that doesn't suit anyone. Um, I, you were talking about how Category 1 income is almost held it like a prestigious type of thing. Um, and then, you know, you have cap two, three, and four, but which are very important for cash flow and stuff like that for the university. But you kind of see the same thing with journal publications, right? There's this, in Australia anyway, we have this, um, the ABDC list, the Australian Business Deans Council, which was just, just updated. And you have these A-star journals, and there's not too many of them. 
and they're these premium sort of star sort of journals, uh, and everyone should be kind of aiming for them. But that doesn't necessarily discount the quality of the research that's in like the A's or even B level journals. I find a lot of good research gets published in those. Do you, do you, would you agree with that? I've long held a view that many journals are equal mm -hmm. and we spend a lot of an incredible amount of time and resource trying to construct elite tables that demonstrate which journal's better than some other journal and sometimes the process behind that's very political. Mm -hmm. I've watched some journals get elevated across the career as I've been watching it just based on the people who are involved in the ranking process and their beliefs and what they think is better or worse. Um, different journals, like I actually edit a journal and have been for, it's in its um, 10th or 11th year now. Wow. So we're in volume 10 as we speak. Um, and that's been amazing because we launched that in a world where the ranking system existed. It was very difficult to get young academics to publish because the system's rewarding them for getting A and A star papers. Exactly. And we would have to appeal to senior colleagues in our field who, I have to say, have still written some of the most cited papers in the journal today. Um, I always had a belief that a lot of journals are equal and that we should stop putting so much attention on our own rankings because at the end of the day, the value in research is if the research is being used. Yes. And academic journals speak to other academics. And whilst that's specifically in marketing, I have to say within medicine and health, it is a bit different because the doctors sometimes read those journals. But those papers are 2,000 words mm. and they're written in plain English or at least an English that that entire profession understands. If I speak to marketing practitioners, and even I've seen it across all of my operations working, there are so many academics that do not speak to people in terms that they understand. Mm -hmm. There is so much jargon that we had to pick up in our training, so many big complex words and ideas that we use that frankly we lose the other people when we speak to them as academics. Now, how that came to be, I don't understand because the value in research is what it can do to deliver outcome change to benefit people. Um, is our research really making a difference if we're just talking to three other academics <laughs> or no other academics or a yeah. hundred other academics? So I think we have to be very critical of this entire system that we've been placed within. Or in my case, I have always tried to think about the actual journal outlet and is it open access and can most people get to it because that really should be what we're all aiming for um, rather than closed you know, Behind formats tables. that people can't, if you don't belong in a university system, you actually can't access them in the first place. And a research gate, like Word document that's not formatted, doesn't look anywhere near as pretty as the real thing. So, or credible, which is a big selling point of it. Yeah, so for me, I'd, I'd have the career advice, and I know senior management is strong on this, but when I served as ANSMAC president, I have never changed my view that we should always think about our own careers and what's good for us too. And as an NHMRC assessor, I can tell you the number of journals you publish and the capacity of your work to deliver actual change is what's getting assessed, Okay. not an A, A star paper. So it is changing at the funding level. Yeah, because the universities are still pushing the, you know, A, A star type model and the reward systems are very much for it. So you'll get like a, a personal development fund of a certain amount if you publish an A star, a lower amount if it's an A. And at our university, for example, you don't get any personal development funds if you are B or below. Mm. And so, I mean, you kind of exhaust the lists if you get rejected from one journal to keep trying to get that at least funding for the next conference to go to, to disseminate your work, or maybe the next sample size to support your PhD student, something like that. Um, and you kind of see why they do it as well, because they get assessed externally and ranked compared to other universities based on those publications and the quality of them. And then that in turn attracts students, especially international students. So it's this whole system that's kind of at the moment feeding into each other that, do you see any of that? I mean, it's changing at the funding level, but do you think that'll change anytime soon? Well, the shifts have been occurring at the funding level over a, a, a series of time. And across my ARC reviewing timeframes, I distinctly recall the moment in time where we were told as assessors not to actually react to A-star and A's. Okay. And then it fascinated me that still today our universities continue to actually promote those lists because it was so clear being an assessor and being involved in the process mm. 
that this is not what we wanted. We did not construct this to have universities playing games to actually try and get better outcomes and jump each other on rank, rank tables and league tables. So yeah. I, I generally have a more pragmatic view and that is I can look to my management to fund me or I can actually create my own outcomes. And a lot of my work has always sought to actually bring in its own income and its own stream to actually support itself rather than being dependent on the whims of whether my manager wants to appoint someone or not um, because I think that's a dangerous world to hit. So dependence is not necessarily something any of us should create. Um, so being a bit of a master or a mistress of your own sort of destiny mm. and being prepared to take head on what you want to do and how you want to get there, I think more people need to have that courage to question why Mm -hmm. to learn other ways and make sure they are bringing all of that into their own practice as well. Because you can, yes, you could play a game and play the A-star, shiny A-star game is what <laughs> I call it, or you can actually ask, you can actually like challenge the system a little bit more by being a bit more true to who you are and what the real purpose of what you are doing should be. Yeah. Um, and for me, dissemination is really important because it gives credibility to the work um, but at the same time, it is not the input of the work I'm doing. It's actually just an output that actually communicates. It's been peer reviewed. Other people agree with this. And again, sometimes my work's not even communicated through that forum. It's gone direct to client because mm -hmm. it's quite commercial and sensitive and it's not seen anywhere. But it's had a huge measurable impact. And, you know, some of these things I think are possibly the things we should be prouder of. Yeah, Dif more difficult to measure, I suppose, and, and you know, universities want to play that. Well, they, they whether they want to or not, they do play that game. But I think you're, you're especially spot on with, you know, the fact that there's all of these journals. Like, so if you're not part of a university, you either pay per article or you pay for a subscription to a, a, for like a, an issue maybe, and they're not cheap. Like no. some of these articles, you know, because they're either American based or usually American based or, or European based. Uh, you know, forty pounds for like one article. And you're like, okay, so who's 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 paying for this in industry? And so you speak to people like all over the world, and they're not reading these journals. So we're not reaching an um, an industry audience, which I suppose is why centres like yours is so important to have the academic rigour, but to be able to translate that into industry. And I kind of think that's how the Institute works as well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just got back from Melbourne and I was speaking to someone there and they operate within sort of sports marketing. And I said to them, like, you know, do, do you read any of these journals? And she's like, look, I, to be honest, I just don't have the time and I don't understand them. And you touched on that as well. She's like, the mathematics that they're using behind them are overly complicated. They try to account for every single possible variable they can, and they lose the audience that they really should be um, appealing to, which is the people who can make a change based on it. Um, yeah, it's quite, quite sad, and I think the medicine do a quite good job of it, right? They do, yeah. and a lot of the work you actually see across medicine is very direct for which drug works best. It's communicating a treatment, an outcome, it's talking about an A versus B. Like mm -hmm. it's in, in market testing terms, it's pretty simple. Mm. And obviously it's talking to professionals in their own language that they've all come to actually learn. And I think some of the social science has really lost sight of what the purpose of even our research and focus was and should have been. Mm. Um, and so whilst I'm the first to celebrate great research, I, I personally will always celebrate the research that has a more direct measurable outcome. What is it capable of delivering? What is it capable of informing and doing? Um, we do need ivory tower, blue sky thinking to create the what's next, but I think that maybe should be 10% of the effort. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of papers and work that goes into things that aren't influencing any outcome anywhere at all. Um, so that's just my personal view. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you as well. So, I mean, you've got to 46 people here. I didn't actually quite realise you were that large. Um, and, like, I've, you know, I've checked out the Nathan campus earlier today. It's quite a beautiful place. It's a little bit outside of the CBD, but, yeah, really nice place. I saw lizards and apparently there's koalas and all sorts of things there. Um, what do you kind of see the future of, of the, you know, social marketing at Griffiths being? Are you, are you looking to expand even more or... Um, what are your goals for the centre? Personally, um, my goals are to try and drive more measurable outcome work in community. 
Um, over the years, we've got um, a range of different projects that we've run and we've got more and more system sort of around how we actually win, walk into a community and start working with that community to empower them um, and hopefully leave them with the, the resources, the skills, what's needed to deliver lasting change. So we love to what I call helicopter in and helicopter back out again. <laughs> Um, so if I could help drive a bit more of that work and can we do that at a larger scale, that would be probably my personal ambition that will see me out through my days quite happily. Yeah. If you asked others in the centre, they will have different um, personal views on where they're actually driving to get to. Um, across some of the team, we have great researchers doing fabulous sort of research and evaluative work trying to drive an agenda forward on how they do that. Others are trying to drive more of a, how can we change the environment to support better health outcomes? Um, so each individual is going to have a different viewpoint and really where we end up is a, it's going to be a story of the sum of us because it no longer is a person and we are very clear about trying to actually see if we can create a bit of a lasting legacy of maybe operating within a business school and demonstrating how business practices can help bring about environment and health change. Yeah, definitely. So you've, um, so like you mentioned, you did your bachelor's so at Uni University of South Australia, um, but you would have been, that's post high school, so did you do all the business courses in high school? Like, how did you get to that point? <laughs> well, like, I don't know, it's such a, I mean, I, I mentioned this to a lot of people, it's like academia is such a, a, a weird profession and I don't even think as little kids you even realise it exists. It's like, I don't know, how, how did you find your way into like academia and marketing? I suppose I know how you got into academia, but Yeah, so my marketing. story is fabulous. I was the one kid that sat there in later high school in the circle of a whole class. As they went around the circle, I'm going to be a teacher, I'm going to be a policeman, I'm going to be this. It got to me and it was like, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, so I'm a fabulous, Brutally honest. <laughs> fabulous story of I then went and got career counselling. So today they've got beautiful diagnostic tools and I watched my kids do all these amazing batteries of tests. Mm. But essentially I went off and I got this like list of six things and it was you could be a clinical nurse, a real estate agent. There's two others I can't remember. Okay. Or marketing. Or marketing. This thing I'd never heard of. Yeah. Had no idea what it was. So I decided in all my wisdom, because I was always clear about I was going to go to university, and I think my parents had a big bearing on that, just planted in my mindset that you will be stronger and better and more capable. Of, so basically you have to go to uni. Um, so I took off and signed up for this funny bachelor thing with that whole view of marketing or for whatever reason I popped in information systems, which didn't appear on that chart. And it was at the point that I had three different information systems, part-time jobs plus my degree that I kind of picked up that maybe that would be a bit boring. Okay. And so then the rest of my story just simply becomes one of, I started in marketing. There wasn't a huge amount of opportunities in Adelaide to enter the marketing field. Like it was already quite clear that you would need to be in Melbourne or Sydney. Today I would tell you you probably need to be in Singapore because most of it's global and it's hardly even at the strategic level happening in this country anymore. Um, so I started off in industry working in South Australia but starting to increasingly realise that sales or business sort of development roles would be where I'd be. And yeah, that's where I just had that accidental shift back into the university through that scholarship where I was like, oh, maybe I'll just go and do a master's and just skill up a bit more. Yeah. Um, and that's how I sort of entered academia by sheer, utter accident. Yeah. But did actually fall in, landed well, and it was at the point that I moved to Queensland that I've had a very brief moment of actually going, do I go back to industry as a consultant and do either market research or st sort of marketing strategy? Um, but then I had a few conversations with very sort of respected colleagues and kind of just imagined this world of either running market research focus groups for pet food or just something really inane and boring. And at that point I could see already that maybe for me the driving agenda, doing what I wanted to do would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then it just took that next couple of years. So I got into my lonely academic hallway that was not in a centre, most doors shut, most people not speaking to each other, which is some people's academic worlds. Yeah. And to me, yeah, not a great one. Um, and that's what made me sort of get the heart and the ambition to go, well, I could already, I knew I could grow a business. So it was like, well, why not try and see if I can actually grow a centre? So 
that was the challenge. I took it on. It Don't became work. a bit um, way more than I ever imagined. And it was only at the start of this year that I sort of stood in front of my team because I'd gone away on sabbatical for the first time in history. I left the centre for three months and left it running. Yeah. And it came, and I came back and it was just running <laughs> fabulously and so well that I was left going, wow, this is great. Yeah. Um, so I stood in front of the team and just said it's so nice to see the creation of a centre that can actually run itself. It's amazing. Yeah, that's actually probably a pretty incredible feeling. You might have left feeling quite anxious about it, like, are they going to survive without me? Um, and then you come back and it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. I've made something, like, self-sufficient. Um, be almost like, almost like a proud parent moment, I'd imagine. It was utterly proud parent yeah. moment, but it wasn't so much can it survive without me. I had the confidence it could. Yeah. Um, essentially why I left and I needed more people to see they could ah. and I think that that was really a part of just trying to break the cycle of you know just because I'd created it and everyone looked to me for what should we do next it was not how I wanted to run a place it yeah. should have I think any center to thrive and survive should actually have a culture of allowing some individuals to become stars if that's who they are mm -hmm. allowing others to be the people who service the work because they don't want to be put in front and centre. Like, all of us have a role to play and I think it's really important that we allow the next generations to emerge fast with strengths where they can and have them front and centre building. And so part of my sort of legacy, I hope, is to help teach some others how else and what else they can do to sort of seek prominence, hit it and start to become the name that people just start emailing because they know that's the person who can do Blah, blah. Yeah, I really like that, the view that you have of, you know, allowing people to play to their strengths. Like, there's some people who don't want to be in the public eye and they don't want to, you know, they want to be proud of their work and they want to be associated with it, but they don't want to be that cool to person. And then there's other people who, you know, like being pushed out in front of people and blow the dust off them and whatever. Um, and there should be roles for, for everyone. We shouldn't all just be um, jacks of all trades, I suppose. Um, and so I mentioned, like, you know, you'd come back as that proud parent moment, but you actually are a proud parent, um, which I think is something that, yeah, I'd like to get, get your views on. Um, like, did you find it uh, challenging in uh, to ra raising a family or, um, you know, because you're the director of this research centre and one that's grown and done quite well, how did you manage to balance all of that? Um, yeah, is it is it possible? <laughs> yeah, I've, I'm a proud mum of three kids, and yeah. today we've got a few sort of fairy like things going on around the house <laughs> as well. Um, each child was essentially a degree, so every okay. time I studied, there was either a, a young baby or something around. So clearly, I got used to being fairly busy juggling both kids and a degree simultaneously. So by the time Rihanna came along, I was studying PhD. Um, she came in and out of work sometimes with me while the other kids were at school. There's a big age gap between the girls. Um, and across the years, like, Dale was my eldest and she hit um, a point in time where she actually just gave me licence to actually do both. Like, she literally just did a sort of a speech that said, I'm sort of proud of mum and mum's taught me I can do anything. And wow. it blew me away. I was um, probably the most sentimental sort of moment I've had. And then I realised then that being a working mum is probably not a bad thing. I had no previous role model because my mum was a stay-at-home mum. Mm. So I think I suffered mum guilt for about 20 years. And that one speech sort of helped me shed that completely to the point where I started to learn to juggle better with a bit less personal guilt. Um, but I had early years where I was, like, there for the kids and having a wonderful lifestyle around it all. And I was the non-serious academic that serviced my job well. Um, by the time my baby, Rihanna, had hit school, I think she was in about year two, at that point I decided I wanted to get serious. And yeah. that really was the beginnings of those first few moves where I serially climbed the, the sort of academic ladder okay. and then put the foot to the floor to see what was possible. Um, and I always had a very strong sort of sentiment which I shared with my team and that is I feel you can grow to the point where you can't. And so for that reason it was like challenging myself trying to see it and, you know, what is the point where it's too much. Um, so we haven't hit that point yet yeah. and we're continuing to explore how else and what else. And, yes, we don't get it right, but my time on sabbatical in the US was deliberately spent in an organisation that grew to 180 people in a very short space of time to just learn yeah. a little bit more from the people leading that group, how they did it, how they've been doing it over time and 
they gave me the confidence that just restacking the decks as often as you need to is exactly how you actually do it. So whose strengths have we got? Who else is on board? Um, and how else can we actually coalesce together to like, essentially pull forward together? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I hadn't actually ever thought about it that much, like in terms of or that way, sorry, that you, you, know, you mentioned your, your daughter had actually seen you as this strong female role model and it helped alleviate some of that guilt that you may have had by pursuing your career as well. Um, yeah, I think, so, I mean, we had a conversation earlier today and you mentioned that academia can have its pros as being a parent as well because you're not required to be at a certain location to, to clock in, clock out. So you were able to do all of those school pickups and drop-offs and um, that really sort of, did that really help you manage both? I think it did because, I mean, I was always, I guess I had this lovely sort of stay-at-home mum a very hard-working dad, um, so that I guess through my parents I'd learnt heaps about how maybe I could come to be, but no direct role modelling of what a working mum looks like. So that was entertaining because I'm trying to be perfect and do everything everywhere and that was crazy. <laughs> I look backwards now and think my kids should have had so much more housework. I was way too <laughs> kind to them. But I kind of juggled it seamlessly and I just shifted the way work was through various stages and today even across people I know like I'm so accommodating in some regards because as long as the work is delivered at the same levels or if the person pro is backwards because they want to stay home more mm. um, I think we should give everyone a little bit more space around this and just try and help with the guilt raising kids is really hard work and when you have three of them, that's a lot. Hmm. And then you go to work and you actually realise work's easier than looking after the three kids. So we have to celebrate the people who are prepared to stay home. Um, in my world, I'd moved away from all of my actual nuclear family. So I built a friend family where we helped each other. I had other friends who were working and so I got a big car so that I could pick up not just three kids but maybe six kids. Wow. They'd be running around in the backyard for two hours after school so that my friends could be at work until yeah. whatever point. Um, it was amazing how much network we put around ourselves to help try and just achieve it because... Someone said to me once, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. And if you create that village, it makes it a bit easier. And I guess that's some of the work I still do today. How else and what else can I do to put something else together to try and get where we want to get to? Yeah. It's amazing what it teaches you. Being a mum and juggling home and work <sighs> and the balance teaches you a lot about how you can juggle things at work too. Yeah, yeah, it sounds, yeah. It'll think, change your world. I think so. It's probably a little while off for me just yet. Um, yeah, I mean, I struggle to find time just for me, but I think I'll, I don't know, people, what do people say when they have kids? They're like, I didn't realise how much free time I had until I had children. <laughs> so I'd probably be the same. I'm like, whoa, I really wasn't that busy. Hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's like, it does take a, a community to raise a family because, or a village to raise a family. Like, you know, my, my sisters both have children and, um, you know, they're very dependent on like their grand, or like my their parents, so my mm. dad or my mum, you know, help babysit or to pick up from school or because it's just it's difficult. They have jobs and maybe their, their jobs are less flexible than academia. So the fact you're able to provide, you know, a car transport service for everyone and a backyard for people to play, like a healthy, safe place and stuff like that. Um, I, guess, I suppose it's the same with like uh, research and, and idea creation. Like it takes a village to raise um, like a, a proper research thing. So collaboration is very, very important for what we do. And uh, I just thought, just wanted to get your views on collaboration, um, collaborations that have worked well for you. You don't obviously don't have to make, mention names, ones that haven't, and what you've learnt from them in terms of whether it's uh, styles, the way that you work and how compatible that is with someone else or um, the way that you look at ideas. And yeah, just collaborations, whether you have any advice for people on that. Oh, look, I'm the first to say that I think we should work in teams. Mm. The broader the disciplinary background of the team that you create, the better the outcomes, okay. assuming you can get past all your language, like jargon differences. Um, I've had very long-term sort of stable relationships across most of my people that I've worked with over time and realistically most of the reasons you, you pull apart are either ideological differences you just are never going to agree mm -hmm. or it's money and the resources that create the essentially what becomes a divorce. Yeah. So jealousy or 
people feel like you've stolen an idea, a person or the money uh -huh. um, are the things that get in the way of very strong collegiate collaborative structures that can last a lifetime. Mm. Um, but the best work comes from shooting the breeze, talking, and it's through that 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 little light bulb click moment kicks in and you're just left going, I can see the next path forward. Yeah. Um, so I personally am a fan. Most of my work, if you look at a big, fat, long CV now, is in teams. Yeah. It's literally being constructed with and through others and it's because of that that I've come to learn what I already know today um, with a whole long list of questions and things of what else I'd love to explore and that takes a team and people <laughs> and someone who says, well, all right, I'll go do that and off they go. Yeah, um, like I, I, I agree with you as well. I think working in teams has its benefits because you all come from different angles at it and um, cross-disciplinary research is, I think, still really in its infancy. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is I don't think universities have got proper, whether it's support structures or reward systems for actually doing it. Um, our university, for example, is saying, you hear it all at the town hall meetings, it's like, yes, cross disciplinary research, we need to do it, we need to do it, we need to do it. But those journalists are not ranked as high and, and those projects aren't getting as much funding. So it's like they're, the system's yet to catch up to their, to their, their perceived um, or what they actually want to do. But yeah, uh, so it, you mentioned that you find that if you find like a good team of people to work with that you've continued to work with? Yeah. How did you originally go about finding those teams of people for perhaps a lot of early career researchers who are... Look, my advice to anyone early career is the people you connect well with personally is probably a good key. Okay. It indicates that might be someone you can actually get along with and work with. Um, but the most important piece of advice I give out is give someone a go. If they fail you, if they fail to deliver on the promise, then let them go. Oh, yeah. Have a think about who you work with that works with you and gives back to you. And if the answer is that you've found someone who kind of gets a lot from you, but you're not getting that same level of response, input or things back, I think you question the value of that partnership because it's failing to be a partnership. It's not... It's not a two-way street, it's a one-way street. Okay. Um, but have a go because have, taking the risk to give someone you don't know who's reached out to you a go could be the best collaboration you ever make. And it's not that we necessarily need to connect personally, um, but asking. Like there are some wonderful collaborations I've actually formed because someone just comes up at the end of a presentation and says, I have an idea. And you go, okay, let's give it a go. And you run with it. And four years later, it's like led to amazing outcomes. Um, that to me is the power of stretching and taking that sort of like first leap of faith. Yep. And it's through taking a few leaps of faith that one day you watch all of those, I'm going to use the words that a, a beautiful professor used to give to me, the runs on the board just start to appear. All yep. these outcomes happen because suddenly you have colleagues and they've all shot five journal papers onto your desk in one day and then you're suddenly left sitting there with a stack going oh wow how am I going to get through all of this work and you realize it suddenly just gets easier yeah okay runs on the board especially early on really important I think it's kind of cool that you mentioned you know you you might have given a presentation someone's like you sparked something off in their head and they've seen what you're doing but from a different angle and then that's led to something else um would you say that going to conferences is one of the best ways to really do that? For me, I've always been a, a really passionate, strong promoter of conferencing and networking. Yeah. Um, it's, been in, it's been part of my DNA. I reached out early partly because I'd left a centre where I had lots of colleagues around me all the time, but I would now tell anyone who's even in that structure, make a network still, get yeah. outside of that culture because you need the different ideas to help push and drive the agenda forward too. Um, what conferencing for me personally delivered were different tribes, people that become my examiners, mm. uh, people that give back in terms of friendly reviews, like I've got a grant or a paper or an idea and I can test it, someone who I can pick the phone up to and just ask who do they know. It's amazing what that does for you in terms of speed and capacity yeah. to move forward better because we're not meant to be standing there as lone sailors on an island. It's a collaborative, collegiate, and science was built on that sort of a model. 
Um, so to think that you can beat the system by sitting behind your computer inside your office producing yet another journal paper is letting you down because longer term, the bigger game is way beyond those. Those papers come because you've won in money and you've got staffing and you've got so much work going on that it's all just always happening. Yeah. And I think that structure in our own training wasn't necessarily, and I say our training as social scientists, it wasn't always there. Scientists actually grew up in a lab and they were literally born into teams mm. and those teams work collaboratively and collegiately and they all help each other. And that's just how they came to be. And social science is a bit different because it still has a culture of competing against each other and not sharing and not giving. And it's holding us back. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it from that angle before, which is obviously why I interview people. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. So I think, yeah, I agree with you. So I interviewed uh, Scott Coslow. So he's very proficient in um, publishing in Journal of Advertising, Journal of Advertising Research is the only researcher who is who is prolific in publishing both, because usually you're kind of um, pigeonholed, I suppose. And he's won, like, awards for reviews, giving reviews at, um, like, JAMS, for example, Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science. And I asked him, like, so what do you think made you such a good reviewer? And he touched on what you kind of said, which was, I have in my mind that the person submitting this paper, this is the first time anyone else besides them has ever seen it. Because often, or I don't know if you said often, but you will find, you know, whether it's early career researchers or professors, they're working by themselves alone on this paper and they have this idea and it hasn't been filtered, it hasn't been tested by anyone else. And he sees his role as to try to help that idea gain momentum and he gives them feedback to make the paper better, not to reject it or anything like that, but to make it better. And I think while his advice is very good for how we could be better reviewers ourselves, I think it touches back on what you were saying in terms of that's not the way we should be working. We, we need to be working in teams of people. We need to have our ideas scrutinised. And we're going to get more out of it. We're going to get more outcomes for ourselves because there's a greater pool of resources to build from. Um, but our ideas and what we produce is going to be better as well. Um, yeah. So in terms of conferences... I mean, which ones would you recommend that people attend, uh, especially, I suppose, if they're interested in social marketing? Um, look, my advice in terms of conferences is to go and find your tribe. Okay. So it comes early from an early mentor who suggested, like, never went to a conference in his own discipline ever. Actually went to completely different outside of the box because that was his way of actually generating ideas. And I guess early in my career, it made me realise that some of the work we're doing, you want to be inside your tent. Sometimes you actually want to be outside of your tent. And I learned very early that marketing was a really dirty word because I went to the Public Health Congress and <laughs> understood that firmly, easily, and started to realise why and started to actually think. So I think you need to just figure out what the main driving thing. So what's your narrative? Yeah. Who are you? What's your story? What do you stand for? And then to start actually building on that by just continually looking across some of the different opportunities that are out there. I do think you should pick a tribe and consistently, certainly as an early career researcher, be there, be prominent. Get in yeah. front of people. It's a great way to actually just help build up your own network over time and be known for who you are and what you do. But at the same time, if funding permits, can you make sure that you actually access other ways of thinking as well? It's important we don't get siloed. We have to actually blur the boundaries and grow the thinking that we actually have yeah. in order to make that next leap of faith. Yeah. Um, okay, so you recommend attending the same one, because they're usually annual, right? So just attending the same one, having that tribe of people, and it doesn't necessarily have to be within, I suppose, your discipline. Can you get to the point where you feel like it's your own party and you've walked mm. into the room where you know people? That would be nice. That <laughs> is an incredible level to actually hit, and that becomes the level of network of colleagues that you can actually utilise to talk to and understand where else and what else is out there. Yeah. It helps you form the teams to create the bigger pockets of work you actually want to do. Um, in terms of funding, we don't always have enough funds to be everywhere every year, yeah. so maybe you could go every second year, or maybe you commit early and invest in yourself and make some of those early years happen. So I will always go to this particular meeting. This is my local network. 
my graduates are going to get jobs if I know other people in this field. Yeah, it's a good point And you've point got to too. have a very long-term thought process here because your own success is measured on do my students get work? Are they strong enough and competitive enough to just walk into jobs? And once you watch, uh, if you've been around for a, a while, you start to understand that that is exactly how this system works. As humans, we're very comfortable with the people we know. Once you've established a reputation as being a person who delivers, Everyone understands that the graduates you've coached probably are that same sort of like mm -hmm. breed. And so that helps them actually, it opens doors in a way that they might have been slammed shut without it. So for me, a really important part of the bigger picture of just getting in really early, having people being known and just making sure that you're helping creating the infrastructure that the people behind you need to. Yeah. Oh, all sorts of refreshing ideas coming from you today. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that actually, in terms of it's not just about you, it's about your students and their futures as well. And I suppose that's a level of thinking it takes when you become director of a place. I'm not at that level yet, but that kind of makes a lot of sense. And it's, and it's your reputation which could open up doors for your students because, yeah, like you said, it's your work ethic and, and, and your quality of work that then they're going to um, associate with these students. Um, yeah, had never thought about it like that. That's really, really quite interested. Uh, interesting. So you do quite a lot of cool work. I mean, I've seen not only you present like numerous times at different places, but many of your students from whether it's social marketing conferences or or just ANS Mac or, and stuff like that. And it's always um, it's very different to the stuff I do. But it's always very, very interesting. Is there any any project that you've particularly found? like to be you've been proud of or um, exciting or yeah anything like that what, what do you look back and think that's a cool I really like that one I think some of the work we did on the dog and koala interaction work with Redland City Council yeah. is a project that I've I've just loved the first time we walked in to run co-design work we understood that it was very political um, dog owners were feeling very attacked by koala activists um, that they were also a bit negative towards council because council takes away trees to build places and spaces and that is the koala's house. Yeah. So it was a very, very political setting and it happened within the first two minutes of starting up a co-design session. And over the course of the years of being in that community, we've kind of changed the conversation where now they can use dogs and koalas in the same sentence and it happens at water coolers and people gave us that feedback. Um, I think other proud moments are when a community person comes and stands next to me and, and they have watched, they were in the co-design sessions and they're standing in the reality. Yeah. So they've gone from idea to seeing it implemented and they're my warm fuzzy moments because it's can we listen and then help with our political will to actually eventuate what people really wanted in the first place yeah. to actually get the outcome that everybody wants to see. Um, that's the work I love love doing yeah where you can see the the real world impacts of and then people obviously interacting with it as well yeah yeah that's um really really exciting uh so i, I know a little bit about sort of marketing textbooks and um like you mentioned philip kotler before like 72 coming up with the terminology of social marketing um but i don't know the social marketing textbooks very well is there one that you would recommend if the, if the audience is interested in or, or uh, is there a piece of work that they should be reading? Look, I've always loved the work of Jared Hastings. Yeah. For me, he's been one of my sort of go-to people, very clever, talented man who led a centre in his own right across in Scotland many years ago. He recently has partnered with Christine Domigan and they both write um, a book together. I think it's gone into its second edition now. Yeah. Um, very is, much. Is this called Social Marketing or...? The first one was the, uh, why does the devil have all the best tunes? <laughs> That's a cool title. Oh, he's got some fantastic titles <laughs> and very, very good at weaving a story and telling it like it is. Um, another like, colleague that's just got an enormous amount of respect across the planet is Jeff French, who yeah. launched the World Social Marketing Series. Now, now today it's the European Social Marketing Conference, the North American Social Marketing Conference. Um, Jeff worked in the public health space and was pretty pivotal in creating a, a lot of driving force across Europe. Um, and he writes with Ross Gordon, who's based here at QUT. Um, but how do you learn social marketing? Probably still today, I would say you can read, but the pre like it's literally the picking it up and doing it is going to be the best way of starting to get the nuanced understanding of how to create win-win solutions. Yeah. 
So we are we going to see a Rundle TLE textbook in the near future? Oh, maybe one day. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> I'd buy a copy of that one. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of a gap there. I don't know. That'd Timo's, be awesome. Timo's on the case. Is he? <laughs> I'll uh, yeah, I'll ask you about it. I'll probably see him tomorrow, I'd imagine. Yeah. It'd be good to see him, actually. Um, yeah, that would be cool. Um, so you're, well, I think you're very successful, and I think objectively you are as well. And so obviously me, I'm subjective. But my question is, I suppose, uh, I've found that people who achieve high things in their life and do quite well in their life have had some sort of guidance or mentoring throughout it. Is that the case with you? Oh, if I critically look backwards, I think there's always been a bit of a driving something just sitting there nested inside. My dad created a really big company, retired nicely at 55, just stepped out, that was it, went fishing, which was always his plan. Yeah. Uh, so I have to attribute some of the work ethic I have. Like success just doesn't get given to you. It's, it's come from what you do. Um, but in terms of like going through um, just hitting the academic sort of mm. cycle and, and deciding where I wanted to get to, I was fortunate to walk into a centre very unwittingly to learn what that was and how it was masterminded and created and I certainly attribute today what I went on to do to Byron and, and knowing how he created sort of marketing science. And even though I wasn't there at the creation, yeah. um, I was very much there at a, a sort of mid-growth point. Um, and that taught me a heap about what might be potentially possible and then just went on to actually do the deep dive and go, I'll try it. I don't know if I can do it. Um, and determine, I had to find the vision first of what would that be. Um, went on to jump in there and I guess the reason some of that all then came to be is I do have a passion for that work and sometimes feedback from audiences says she's very passionate mm. and it's partly my now heritage. I understand the family context I grew up in, the socioeconomic area I lived in. Um, I can see a lot because of where I came from um, and that today helps me with a bit of drive and passion, want to do a little bit more to redress the imbalances that exist in Australia. Um, they're, they're obviously global as well. Mm -hmm. And whilst we can celebrate when we're commercial that we have contributed to economic growth and, and people's livelihoods and, and good money, at the same time, in a human perspective, we're doing a pretty lousy job of making sure that's happening at an even level. Um, and there are some people that just don't have the same opportunity. And when you start to learn the social health side, you really do get start to appreciate that a child that lives in a middle income household will have double the words of a low socioeconomic home. Wow. So it is a wow moment. And it says there's so much more that can and should be done. I'd like to see a little bit more energy and effort now with everything that we know I'm a big believer our future can be better for all that we've already learned and there's got to be a little bit more courage across the system to say, but this isn't good enough. So I guess that will see me out professionally and I'll enjoy watching maybe kids and grandkids grow up and mm. see myself out. That'd be exciting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's similar. So like, cause I grew up in Gola and, um, like, uh, not necessarily some of my friends, but some of the, the kids when I was younger, you, I could already tell at that moment that they have less opportunities. Mm. Um, and, and usually it's to do with their home life, like maybe their parents weren't cooking meals for them and you're wondering why that child was particularly big and you're like, oh, okay, because no one's teaching nutrition and no one's cooking for you, so you're eating frozen meals that were deep fried or whatever and and your vocabulary is it's very limited because maybe that's the extent to your parents' knowledge and, and maybe a reflection of the school quality as well a little bit. And, it, and it, even at a young age, I was quite sad about it that you could already see that this kid, even if they really wanted to be someone, didn't have the opportunities as someone else. And so I think something, yeah, something does need to be done about that for sure. Um, so your, uh, you know, you, being the director of the, of the um, centre, a lot of your role is, is leadership and guidance. So do you see yourself as being a mentor role to some of the younger people in your organisation? And um, what, what things do you think that you've done in that way that have been quite successful that have really helped them to grow their careers? And then I suppose on the other side, what would the people that you're mentoring, 
do to get the most out of your time, how to get the most out of your experience and knowledge? So experience and knowledge comes from getting on with it and doing it. And you can sit back and think and talk and, and try to anticipate, but that's not going to actually create the learnings of I've been there and done that. Yeah. Um, the strength of the, the time, I guess, is to learn the people and understand what drives them a little bit. Where else could they go? Yeah. Scaring them into it. So pushing them before they're ready um, or at the point that they're ready but they don't think they're ready because some yeah. people are more naturally cautious and want to hold back until they think they're perfect and ready. Um, I think they're the things that over time I've done to help get us all where we actually need to be. Um, because I'm a big believer that you've just got to jump in there sometimes and actually give it a go. Yeah. As founding director, I probably spend a lot of time teaching people what I know, um, just working directly with them, rolling my sleeves up and doing it with them wherever I can. Yeah, so it's all about pushing people outside of their comfort zone when they're ready. No, um, even no, before they're ready even sometimes. Even before they're ready. I'll give you many personal <laughs> stories of there is a moment where I know they're ready, they don't and they're not confident that they're ready either and they, if I let them sit, it would be years before they'd actually jump themselves. So I think there's some of that that you have to maybe, maybe you just have a sense, maybe you know somehow, but you do understand when someone's actually ready and today being a bit more senior again, I can actually literally coach others to say the moment I'm not breathing down your neck every five seconds is because you've already won my trust. Hmm. So part of it is, can you be the person that can deliver every time, not sometimes, mm. every time, and just making sure that it's at the standard needed to actually take all of that work forward. And it's difficult to do when you haven't done something before and giving people the confidence that you don't know yet and I know you don't know, but how about we just keep that conversation very open to the point where you've got everything you need and you're at that point where you can actually dive and go. Yeah. Yeah, good advice. Um, so you, I mean, right at the beginning of this conversation, you were talking about being um, the editor of the International Journal, Journal of Inter Journal of Social Marketing. Journal of Social Marketing. Um, so you, did you establish that one? Yes, I yeah. did. And That's with with a colleague. Yeah. So reached out because nobody knew who Sharon Rundle Tealy was. It was a UK based publishing house. Um, found a colleague across in the UK through conversations and the rest just became history. So I'd already put up the journal once without any sort of person that was known to them to create the trusted environment. So I launched the journal with Andrew McCauley as co-editor yeah. and I think by, it might have been volume three, so forgive me if I'm wrong, <laughs> um, he stepped down, left me and then later on I actually got two co-editors. So today Christine Domigan and Mike Basil over in Canada oh, yeah. um, assist me because the load of papers once we got an impact factor and it would have been nice to get re-ranked re into an A because we mm. were at the time the premier journal and they've now ranked these two journals together. Um, it's It created a lot more traffic into the journal and a lot more work. So the whole drive of that university system to say you must publish in B mm -hmm. and above, you can see completely see it because it's happening planet wide and the day you get an impact factor your journal submissions <laughs> treble. Yeah, wow. Um, so you've seen the, the growth of it, that's really exciting. What sort of topics are you looking for um, in that journal? What's the, what's the way forward for it? So this journal publishes marketing's application oh to God. bring about health, social or environmental change. Mm. Um, so it can be insight studies that are looking at data to understand a situation. It could be case studies demonstrating interventions that have been evaluated, showing what they can be, evidence reviews, um, conceptual papers, so thinking about what, where to next. Um, so we're very strong in encouraging all different types of research. Okay. Um, but essentially is it marketing application to actually get an outcome? So it just has to be set in that very, what is social marketing sort of space. Yeah. Is there any sort of hot or trending topics in the area at the moment? Uh, a lot of systems thinking has been thinking. dominating um, or certainly moving into the space of social marketing. Yeah. As people understand there is complexity, it's not as simple as just telling Zach you need to eat more fruit and veg or you have to have an apple today. Um, which was essentially the topic that we were getting <laughs> a, a great seminar at lunchtime on today. Um, 
but it is just about trying to push forward as best as we actually can. Yep. Great. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I've had a great conversation with you. Thank you for taking the time out. Um, is there things that you would advise people early on in their career to, to accomplish or things that you would want people in industry to, to, to move forward with? Um, I suppose more the question is, given everything that you know from like your experience from you know the journal editor running the center um, and you know working all over the world in this area what what are the key things that you'd want people in academia and industry to do as a result um, what what would you be very happy to see happening I want more people to measure impact to understand are the changes that we are doing overall contributing to positive outcomes I think too much window dressing still goes on. Mm. It's too easy to hide and not have the true hard conversations needed. So if I'm going to introduce and innovate and bring in a new product, is that product beneficial for society? Is it contributing to obesity? Is it having negative outcomes? I really think we have to ask harder questions um, because certainly in the public health sphere or the environmental sphere, our work's getting measured to the last letter about impact and what its capacity to deliver prop, you know, the positive outcomes we need to see as a society. And I don't think the business side is actually asked that enough. Mm. Um, it gets away with not having to, and I don't know why and how. So could academia challenge for that practice to be mandated or, because I mean, we're going to have to mandate if, if it just continues to run unfettered. So can business academics and can other academics change the conversation in teaching so that no one graduates thinking that I have to just exist to make profit, mm. that I am actually here to say how else and what else can we be doing to make our world a better place. So to give a really clear, easy example today, I think we should all be questioning plastics and how the hell we have so much packaging that's continuing to dominate. So you're seeing more and more little inserts and closures going into packaging across all of the product lines everywhere, all under the auspices of hygiene mm. or safety, yet no one's having that rounded circular conversation that says, but what about the environment and the biodiversity of this planet? What are we doing to our planet? So we cannot continue to produce at more and more volumes and create more and more and more of this stuff that doesn't doesn't degrade. Mm. So a recent mission we were working on that went to Indonesia, if you think biodegradable plastics are biodegrading, then you need to make certain that the conditions that that biodegradable plastic is put into, so in other words, if you bury it in landfill, but it needed sun to biodegrade, yeah. it's never going to biodegrade. No. So not enough of the really big questions are being put across the totality of everything we're doing and I know it's difficult, but I think these are all the conversations we should be having. And it's difficult to understand that big picture mm. when you work in a silo. And if you are not working across boundaries in and outside of academia, if you're an academic, so get out there and start having this massive network and these conversations because you need to see that bigger picture to bring about the change we need to see. Yeah. From an industry perspective, it's being challenged every day to go, how can we reduce our footprint? What else can we do to make this place and protect our planet and our people? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I think it really it sort of does do a pretty good job of summing up, I think, really what kind of was the theme of this conversation in the end, which was, you know, get out of your office, work with lots of people, work with diverse groups of people, and create a tribe of them that can actually have a real world impact. And make but, sure they're not the same people. Make yeah. sure they're people of, from all walks of life, yeah. different backgrounds, learn to speak across different types of people. It's amazing what you start to learn, and it needs to happen more. Yeah, I think that's kind of cool. I learned quite a lot from this, <laughs> which is good. Um, yeah, so just, just you know, to leave everyone on a, uh, on a really good note, um, is there any sort of life advice or something that you kind of live by that you think you'd like to pass on to, to the listeners? Is there anything that you've sort of had like a mantra or a, or a way of looking at life? Or Oh, look, I've probably always like subscribed a little bit to Nike. Just do it. Just do it. Stop thinking about it. Yeah. Just do it. It's from that that you learn, and the failures can contribute just as much as the successes. Yeah. Um, I think my experience is just doing it has meant the failure never really happened at all, 
Um, so I, I guess there would be some critics and various things out there where parts don't happen as others saw that they should. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's a beautiful sort of one to take away. Jump yeah. in there and give it a go. Just do it. Or just get yourself out of that comfort zone. Yeah. Make yourself a bit scared. It's amazing what's going to come next. Yeah. That's really, really good because it's really action-based. It's going to push people to go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out Pleasure. and speaking to us. Thanks for having me, Zach. Yeah, we, we all know how, just how busy you are. I speak to everyone you work with. They're like, oh, my God, Sharon's here. <laughs> so very, very fortunate. So thank you. Hey, guys. It's Zach Ainsbury here with just a couple of quick reminders. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, then make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. There are plenty more interviews to come with some of the world's leading marketing academics and the practitioners. You do not want to miss these. In the meantime, if you're looking for another way to connect, then follow me on Twitter at Zach Ainsbury. That is Z-A-C-A-N-E-S-B-U-R-Y for my take on the marketing issues of the day.